This Week on Waterways, Nutrient Studies in Florida Bay, and Staghorn Coral Nurseries off of Key Largo. Sometimes, an idea is spoken so many times, it becomes accepted as fact. When complex concepts are whittled down to flashy headlines, meaning can be lost. When these utterances are not supported by solid science, they prove to be a huge disservice. And when the misinformation sounds convincing and is about something people care deeply about, overcoming that misinformation can be a challenge. For the last 10 years, newspapers have carried stories of a scientific debate about Florida Bay. According to the papers, one side says the bay is suffering from a lack of fresh water from the Everglades. The other side says that the bay is being polluted by water from the Everglades and that getting more water to the bay would make the situation worse. Jim Forkren has been studying nutrients in Florida Bay for 25 years. According to Dr. Forkren, while the debate is lively in newspapers, it's not so lively in scientific publications. The evidence that nitrogen from the Everglades is harming Florida Bay is very weak. There is a, a general perception in the uh, lay public that there is too much nitrogen and phosphorus running into Florida Bay from upstream. And so far the data that we have don't bear that out. Um, there is very, very little phosphorus running into Florida Bay. And there is an appreciable amount of nitrogen running into the bay, but the bay itself is limited by the availability of phosphorus, not the availability of nitrogen. Plants need nutrients called nitrogen and phosphorus to grow. But when they get too much, problems ensue. In lakes, rivers, or the sea, too much nitrogen or phosphorus can fuel the overgrowth of algae. When algal overgrowth turns the water into murky shades of green and brown, plants like seagrasses do not get enough sunlight and may eventually die. Anyone who has seen an algae-choked pond has seen what too many nutrients can do to living waters. One of the first jobs for scientists studying pollution or potential pollution is to find out which nutrient could be a problem. Is it nitrogen or is it phosphorus? It can't be both. That's because, according to a rule in science called Liebig's Law of the Minimum, only one element limits a plant at one time. Liebig was an agricultural researcher in the 19th century. His research showed that plants like algae are kept in check by the lack of one key nutrient. Add that nutrient and the plant will take off. In many algae-plagued waterways throughout the world, the nutrient that scientists are often worried about influencing an ecosystem is nitrogen. Um, nitrogen tends to run off of uh, human disturbed parts of the land and into the water column and most of the ocean is limited by nitrogen and what that means is um, if, if a system is nitrogen limited, if you gave it more sunlight you wouldn't grow more plants, if you gave it more phosphorus you wouldn't grow more plants, but if you gave it nitrogen you would grow more plants. Nitrogen is a huge problem for many coastal areas along the East Coast. For example, in Chesapeake Bay, nitrogen runoff from farms, sewage treatment plants, and lawns and golf courses have fueled algae blooms that have killed off the bay's native eelgrass. But Jim's research has shown that in Florida Bay, phosphorus, not nitrogen, is in short supply. In the 1980s, Jim had done the first comprehensive study of nutrients in the bay for his doctoral dissertation. He ground up hundreds of plant samples from all over the bay and measured their contents. He learned that almost all plants in the bay needed phosphorus, not nitrogen, meaning they were phosphorus limited. Taking the results of his research one step further, Jim hypothesized that if you added nitrogen to the bay, nothing would happen. But he wasn't content to rest on this hypothesis cooked up at his desk. He wanted to prove it. To do this, he set up a study in Florida Bay 
where he added nutrients, recreating the kind of pollution that some claimed was taking place, and watched to see what would happen. For those worried about what this might do to the bay, Jim's study plots were only two foot by two foot square. Well, we wanted to uh, experimentally determine what would happen when we added nitrogen or phosphorus to the seagrass beds. So in October 2002, we started, uh, started an experiment where we put a grid of plots at six different sites across Florida Bay, from the very phosphorus limited parts to the parts closer to the Gulf that are more nutrient enriched. And in each of these plots, we would add either nitrogen or phosphorus or both or neither. And the goal was to find out what would happen to the seagrass beds and the associated animals that live in them when we added nutrients. Every three months, Anna leaves from Key Largo and sets out to monitor the study plots where they previously added phosphorus and nitrogen. When she gets to a site found by GPS, she measures the amount of seagrass, the types of seagrass, and the macroalgae that are in each plot. She then takes samples of the seagrass tissue so that she and Jim can measure the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus that are in the seagrass. At each site, there are 24 plots in which they have four different treatments. On 25% of the plots, nitrogen only is added. On the next 25% of the plots, only phosphorus is added. On the third 25%, both nutrients, phosphorus and nitrogen are added, and the last 25% act as control plots, with no nutrients added. In our experiment, we add the, the nutrient, the nitrogen and uh, phosphorus fertilizer, right to the sediment. But it dissolves, when it dissolves into the, into the water, it's both accessible up in the water column, in the, the foot that's just above the sediment, and also into, right, it dissolves into the sediment itself. And so that means the nutrients we add are available for both the seagrass, which can take nutrients up both through the leaves as well as through the root systems, as well as to the macroalgae and the microscopic algae that live above the sediment and on the seagrass leaves. After two and a half years, the results are very clear. The eastern and central parts of Florida Bay are starved for phosphorus. When phosphorus is added, plants in these areas grow like they're on steroids. In the western bay, the plants are low in phosphorus, but not so low that they respond to it. Add phosphorus and very little happens. The most interesting results were with nitrogen. In no place within Florida Bay did the seagrasses or the algae that grows on them respond to nitrogen. But one of the reasons it was so important to look at adding nitrogen into Florida Bay is because other studies done on other parts of the system, especially phytoplankton, in the western part of the bay have shown that nitrogen addition in the western part of Florida Bay changes the nature of the phytoplankton community in the water column. Um, so we, we were trying to see if somehow the water column is different from the benthos, and, and our study so far says it is, that we're not finding any nitrogen responses in the benthos. Jim is careful to note that his results only apply to seagrasses and algae that grow on the bottom. The yearly algae blooms that sometimes cloud the water in central Florida Bay still need to be studied. While they make the water murky during the wet season, they don't kill seagrass, and they might have been a part of the bay for years. No one knows because few people were studying the bay before 1987. Anna and Jim's results suggest that Florida Bay seagrasses are not threatened by nitrogen. Why is this true? Unlike places further north, South Florida and Florida Bay is made of limestone. Limestone locks up phosphorus, leaving very little available for plants. But in South Florida, because of the fact that uh, we're, we live in a calcium carbonate environment, the, the shell material that makes up all of our soils, uh, phosphorus sticks to that and doesn't move around very much in a calcium carbonate geology environment. So the fresh water we have running off of the Florida Peninsula, which is all carbonate, is stripped of all of the phosphorus in it. So when it, it, it comes to our shore, there's plenty of nitrogen in it, 
but not a lot of phosphorus dumping into the ocean. And that leads to a phosphorus limited state of the, the very near shore coastal ocean. Jim points out another fact that makes it unlikely that runoff from the Everglades is harming Florida Bay. Taylor Slough contributes a small fraction of the total water in the bay. Uh, Taylor Slough itself is only about 10% of the water budget. That means uh, 10 times more rain falls on Florida Bay than runs into Florida Bay out of the Taylor Slough. So the agricultural practices in the southern part of the Everglades have a relatively small impact on Florida Bay. The scientific method is a structured system with stringent guidelines. Part of this method is conducting experiments and publishing papers in reputable journals so that the experiments and findings can be reviewed and even repeated by fellow scientists. Great ideas with no scientific data backing the ideas are a great starting point, but are not much use for resource managers. Resource managers in the Park Service prefer to make decisions based upon science. Anything else is conjecture. Imagine a place. A place where humans could grow corals like they grow tulips. A place where sightseers were guaranteed snorkeling and scuba adventures where every color of the rainbow was present. A place where corals were not threatened with extinction. Just off Key Largo in the Atlantic Ocean, there is a place called the Staghorn Nursery. Here, a local teenage girl named Kelly Niedenmeyer maintains a coral nursery. It is here that she hopes to change the face of Key's reefs. It is here that she ventures at least three times a month to cultivate the branching hard corals. But the story begins many years before, and it began with cultivating rocks. Marine life collectors are commercial fishermen. They don't use a rod and reel, and they don't remain topside. Marine life collectors do their fishing from underwater. They collect all sorts of marine life, both vertebrates, like tropical fish, and invertebrates, like anemones. They even harvest rocks found on the sea floor. These rocks are called live rocks in the industry because they have organisms living on their surface. The fish and other organisms that these fishermen and women collect are shipped all over the country for use in aquariums. One of the uh, many lessons learned that we learned in the 70s in the marine life industry is that for years uh, the collectors would chip away the rock and, and put it in boxes and ship it all over America and all over the world. And what we realized over time, particularly after I started managing the Luke Sanctuary in 1983, is that every time some of that rock was taken out of the habitat, the habitat wouldn't return the way it was. So in the 80s, the state of Florida prohibited the taking of any live rock from the reef, any wild harvesting or taking of live rock. The federal government prohibited the taking of live rock in 1997. As a result, the marine life collectors that focused on live rock would be left without a product to sell. Having a professional background as a marine life collector, Billy commiserated and soon found a solution. The marine life collectors could lease plots on the sea floor and then transplant rocks from other sources, like quarries, into their leased area. Within years and even months, the bare rock would become live rock, which could then be collected and sold. And I think it's a fascinating idea. Take rocks, put it in the water, get things to grow on it, and sell it for $10 to someone. I love it. And at $10 a pound, by the way. So it, it's an incredible opportunity. And, and uh, Ken Niedemeyer was one of the first marine life collectors to take us up on, on the challenge that if you will work with us, we will work with you. Problem solved. Conservationists working with managers, working with the commercial industry, but soon, this happy compromise and partnership began a new chapter. 
something no one saw coming. He called me in the latter part of the 90s, early 2000, and he said, Billy, I have a problem. We're getting a lot of quarrels settling on our live rock. And I went to our attorneys, I went to the Noah attorneys, and I, I said, look, this is his rock, it's his property, and we think these are his quarrels. The Noah attorneys agreed. Not only were the rocks in the aquaculture Ken Niedenmeyer's property, the corals growing on them must be his as well. Ken's financial future was looking rosy. Corals were not sold anywhere in the U.S. because they are protected in the wild from harvesting. And growing corals indoors had never proven a profitable or easy endeavor. Corals are not on the market anywhere. This species of coral is not legally on the market anywhere in the United States. And I could, I could make money doing that, but Money wasn't everything. I think that there's a bigger need for that coral and for studying it down here in the Keys. And because I personally own the coral at this point, I can do what I want with it. Ken knew that if he began selling his corals, he could open a black market for the wholesale of corals in the Keys and elsewhere in the Caribbean. He had seen how the industry worked during his 30 years, and he had witnessed more than 90% of the branching corals in the Keys die off in that time. Years ago, staghorn was one of the most common corals in the Keys, and it was a major reef builder. And there were areas where there was huge, several acre thickets, even bigger than that, almost, well, I don't want to say square miles, but there was huge thickets that would go as far as the eye could see. And the fish, the fish would love those because they could hide, small fish could hide in those thickets, and big fish couldn't get at them as easily. And so they were major nursery grounds. They provided a lot of habitat. They were, they were all over the Keys, mostly on the, mid-channel and offshore reef areas, not necessarily inshore, but over the last 20 or 30 years, those thickets have disappeared. Staghorn corals, like elkhorn coral, are of the genus Acropora and are some of the faster growing corals in the Keys Reef Tract. But they're also one of the most sensitive species, sensitive to pathogens, sensitive to storm damage, sensitive to temperature changes. That is why the prospect of staghorn or elkhorn nursery is so appealing. But Ken Niedenmeyer didn't have a plan, yet. And then what would happen is turtles or sharks or storms would break pieces of the coral off as it would get bigger. And the next time I'd come out, I'd find pieces laying on the ground. So I would stick those in rocks, little holes in the rock or whatever. I just wedge them here or there. And some of them would grow, maybe 25% would grow and the other 75% would die. But bit by bit, I was getting more of that coral on my farm. I didn't have any new coral settling, but the stuff that was alive was growing and pieces that would break off were growing. And I started getting the idea that maybe we could intentionally break these and reattach them with some sort of glue to other rocks start spreading them that way and then we got the idea of taking small rocks like fist sized rocks and gluing little pieces of coral on them. Ken was excited about his side project. His thoughts soon turned to conversations over dinner where a young and impressionable daughter Kelly was absorbing all the information and passion Part of growing up with a dad who's involved in the marine conservation is constantly hearing about it, whether at the dinner table or just one-on-one. -on -one. And so I guess a couple years ago we started talking about the possibility of doing something to actually help the environment. And um, my dad has a live rock site that he grows live rock on and then ships it out. And I guess when the hurricanes came through a couple years ago, staghorn started settling onto it. And he did pretty much didn't touch it so until one day when we were talking about it and he mentioned that staghorn um, grows and spreads through propagation and so we decided that hey this could you know we could do something with this we could take this and we could propagate it and continue to propagate it and make more pieces so it pretty much just started out as an experiment we really didn't know what we were doing we had a lot of trial and error. Ken put his daughter in touch with the reef doctor a scientist named Harold Hudson who happened to work at the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary in Key Largo and was an expert in corals and coral restoration. Through Harold's work rebuilding the structure of coral reefs damaged by ship groundings such as the Elpis, the Maitland, and the Columbus Isselin, 
Harold learned techniques that earned him his nickname and a reputation around the world. Another thing that's actually cool about using our corals is that when we put them out there, um, there had been white band disease that had been killing a lot of the stag cone coral in the area, and ours was the only coral that was not affected by it. We had no deaths. And so that was another reason for using our particular genetic genes of corals that they'd shown a significant resistance to this white band disease that was completely wiping out these different um, corals in various areas. Using these nursery corals for grounding restorations is also a great possibility. The Keys has between 400 and 600 boat groundings each year. Many of these groundings are on coral reefs. When the corals are destroyed, they can take more than 100 years to return, if they return. Imagine, I can pick up the phone and call Ken and say, Ken, we need some staghorn coral at one of our grounding sites. And he and his daughter can go out and, and, and supply some of these corals to us. He's already working with scientists up and down the Keys to establish other aquaculture sites similar to his uh, up off Key Largo. But Billy Causey had never thought small, and the idea of coral nurseries all over the Keys has stuck in his mind, and new hope has blossomed. I envision someday picking up the phone, calling people like Ken Niedermeyer, or calling someone like Dave Lackland with Moat Marine Laboratory and saying, you know, Ken, I need four dozen mustard hill corals, I need three brain corals, and we need a half a dozen staghorn corals because we have a boat grounding and we need to put the, the corals back. And Ken comes down, he works with our restoration biologists, they go out and put it back in, on, on site. Just like you would call your native plant nursery and say, you know, I need four gumbo limbos, I need some Jamaican dogwood, and, and, and so on. But these goals are long-term, and Billy knows he can't do it alone. He knows it's the Kelly Niedenmeyers of the world who need to take those next steps. And it's an incredible sight to see all these teenagers. In fact, there was one 10-year-old boy out there on the ocean floor, busily putting this aquaculture site together. And now they've gone from a dozen colonies to hundreds of colonies that they have out there. And it's an incredible sight to see. So it's been really cool to get other people involved in it and get my generation involved in what's going on in the reefs because essentially my generation is what's going to continue to take care of it once, you know, once the older generation retires. It's really my generation that's going to be responsible for taking care of the reefs and for continuing to make sure that it's taken care of and that things are healthy. So I think it's important that kids my age are educated on um, the problems that are involved out there and just the constant change of our environment. Mm -hmm.